Marshall Smith for our closing prayer. Jim. sing one song before we have the scripture reading and prayer. First two songs will be from the supplement. The invitation song will be from the regular book. First song is number four. The battle belongs to the Lord. Heavenly armor will enter the land, the battle belongs to the Lord. No weapons that fashioned against us will stand, the battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood. Battle belongs to the Lord, and we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses and hard, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor. Power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. Now, scripture. Scripture reading will be taken from Psalms, starting with uh, Psalm 100. We'll be reading Psalm 100 and 101. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. En enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. I will sing of mercy and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praises. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. My eyes shall be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. Early I will destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord.
your most holy and righteous Heavenly Father. We offer you our thanks for this opportunity to be here tonight, the close of this first day. We give you our praise for being our God, for being the one who created us and sustains us, who gives us so many good things, provides us with families, and who provides us with the family of God plan of salvation that through the shed blood of Jesus Christ we may have the redemption and be your children. Holy Father, we're grateful that today we've been able to assemble and to partake of the Lord's Supper and to remember the death of our Lord. We're grateful, Father, that throughout the world there are Christians doing this. We strive to worship according to how they read in, in the New Testament. We pray that blessings upon our brethren throughout the world and upon their efforts to preach the gospel. Pray thy blessings upon this group, this church, for those who lead, for those who serve, for those who preach to us. Pray thy blessings upon each family, upon the husbands, the wives, the fathers and mothers, the children, the grandchildren. Pray thy blessings upon those who are older. Pray that their faith will be strong and they may not well on disappointments in their lives, but instead look forward to the hope of eternal life. Pray that blessings upon our young people and the decisions they'll be making in coming times. Pray that they may always strive to serve you and to consider your will as they make these decisions. Pray our Father for those who are sick, who cannot be here tonight. We are grateful for Sister Greg, who can be here, and we are grateful for her improvement. Pray thou blessings upon the uh, Craig family at this time, and for others who have lost family members in recent times. Pray for any who might be here tonight who need to obey the gospel. Pray they'll think seriously uh, about that decision. Pray for others who are family members and friends who need to take that step. Pray that they may have the time and the health and the state of mind that they may be able to make that decision. Pray for our leaders of this nation and those, our decision makers, our leaders and judges, and pray for the moral climate of our country, Father. Pray that we may have more leaders who are concerned about preserving that climate and looking to the uh, moral principles of your word. We pray, Father, for uh, you'll defeat those who are proponents of immorality and false religion. We pray you'll bless our enemies and defeat their counsels for evil against us. Pray for the leaders of our state and also Father of our uh, our city. We pray for the, the people who live here, the, the friends we have, the neighbors we have, and others. We pray that this church here may be a group that uh, its members provide good examples to our fellow citizens. We pray for the sick of our community, the poor, the widows, and the orphans. Each day that we live, Holy Father, may we be mindful of the examples that we set. May we have a strong desire to read your word each day and to follow its precepts, to teach our children, to uh, consider its precepts as we make our own decisions. Pray, Father, we may have strong faith, that we may delight in thinking about the joys of heaven and anticipating these joys. And pray, Father, we would be mindful of our examples to others. We are ever grateful, our Father, for your plan of salvation, that through the shed blood of Jesus we can be reconciled to you and be your children. We hold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we be called children of God. Be with us this night, Holy Father. May we be attentive to the speaker, help him to present those things he wishes to say. We ask these favors and blessings in Jesus' name. If you're using a book, 
can turn to 279. That'll be the invitation song. Number 279 is the invitation song after Brother Michael's lesson. Before his lesson, we'll sing number 22 out of the supplement. Be strong and courageous. That's why we sing these words that you really pay attention uh, to what's being said. It has a, a lot to do with the lesson tonight. If you would, please stand if you're able. Strong. I'm sorry. Um, let me start that again. Be strong. You must have. out of the way. Lucy colored on my pants this morning and then just spit up on my shoulder. So 
I look a little weird, but blame the one girl. Uh, I know we just had a prayer, but let's have a, let's have a quick prayer before we start. Dear Lord, we come to you now as we're about to open up your word. We pray that we come to you with a mind of reverence and an eagerness to learn and understand. I pray you be with me as I bring this lesson. I pray you be with all of us as we open up your word and with the respect you do to the guidelines and rules and promises and love that you provide, provide for us in your word for our lives. In Jesus' name. I like to ask. It kind of helps me uh, calm down a little bit. I'm nervous, but I kind of tend to uh, rush through things if I don't get a good start. I'm not nervous, I'm not really scared. I've got some weird fears. You may have, you may have a, a fear of not turning the microphone on for two other people. You may have a fear of um, snakes or spiders or something like that. I have really weird fears. I have, um, when I was younger, I used to collect books about the Titanic. You know, a lot of monster. Got an obscure fear of really big things under deep water. That's irrational, but it's my fear nonetheless. And it's a fear that I don't ever have to deal with. I'll never voluntarily go to the bottom of the ocean and explore the Titanic or see if I can find a lot of monster. So that's good. If you're a friend of spiders, I'm sorry, you gotta deal with it now. Good Join me and get rid of my best monster. But we have fears in life that we have to deal with, right? As a student, there are times when they're in trouble or not. You have to meet with an administrator, you have to meet with a principal, or someone in charge. It's a nerve wracking thing, but you have to do it. It has to be done in some form or fashion. You have a final coming up, you have to do it. It's a nerve wracking thing, but it has to be done, right? And as adults and as, as people, as you grow up, if you, you get into the corporate world, and there are different meetings that you need. You're in charge of a presentation, but you're in charge of an estimate for someone's home. And you're in charge of this budget. You're in charge of this and that. You meet with your boss. You don't really want to do it. There's some anxiety there. But it just has to happen. And it, uh, these things can't be avoided. And we just deal with them. We all have things like that. And we certainly all have things like that as Christians, in our lives as Christians. I was raised in America, so we can talk about America a little bit. Uh, Wednesday night, how great the country is. Of course, I was raised here. I was also raised in Alabama, a very state country. I was raised in Limestone County. I went to Adams High School, private school, kindergarten, and grade. I was brought up in a Christian home, with Christian parents. Graduated high school, went to a Christian college where there were five hundred people in Florida. Uh, at the college where we opened the Bible every day, we just stayed with me at the Bible school. Graduated and now I live still in Arkansas County where everyone on every corner, anyone, anywhere knows who God is, Jesus is, and the great plan of salvation. They may have different interpretations, but they are believers. More than likely, you, you, that's what the case is. What do I have to be afraid of as a Christian? I have the most easy situation ever. It seems to be a Christian. From getting into my life to this very moment, if I would show my resume of life to someone, they would say, You have no problems. If I would show somebody who's trying to be a Christian in the jungles of Africa, I think they would laugh because of the struggles they have, they have compared to what I have as a Christian. What fears do I have to be afraid of? What fears, what, what do you have to have courage for? Why do you need to create courageous in any way as your as your life as a Christian? Well, we do have some. We don't have to necessarily fly off the rule of warfare and get to a building and meet other people. We have some things that are, are really serious to our salvation and salvation of other brothers and sisters. If you'd like to go ahead and turn your Bible to the first Kings, chapter 18, we're going to come around a bit through your swords tonight and uh, Primarily in the Old Testament. So we've got, we have a lot of situations that we do have to uh, pay attention to, and fears, and things that cause anxiety, and just pressure, and stress. Here in First Kings chapter 18, you're looking over already. You know what we're about to talk about, hopefully. 
So Elijah is the prophet of God. He's, he's the character in this, in this section of, of the book. And we start looking at some of his issues. So Elijah is facing, facing some real issues of being, um, of having reason to be afraid and having reason to be courageous. In chapter 18, verse 22, uh, we'll start the reading there. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us, and let us choose one bull. Uh, let, let them choose one bull for themselves, and cut it into pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire on it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire on it. And you will call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of, my, of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Everybody agreed, that's a good challenge. Let's do this. So everyone, all these 450 prophets of Baal meet with Elijah and it hasn't rained in three and a half years, and they're up here, and, and he says, this is what we're going to do. You get a calf, I get a calf. We're both going to prepare. Whatever God takes care of this, that will be the Lord, and that will be a definitive answer of who we will serve. So as we would keep reading, Elijah preps uh, his, his area. He digs a trench, and again, it hasn't rained in almost four years. He adds water three times to fill the trench, to cover everything, everything saturated. Then Elijah prays to God. God sends fire and takes everything out, burns the stones, burns the dirt, licks up all the water. The prophets of Baal praise God, and then Elijah demands and commands for all of these prophets to be killed. So he kills 450 of them. The following chapter, we see um, we see that the the uh, Rain has come back, Elijah being a man of God, prays to the Lord, and the rain returns after nearly four years. Jezebel, the queen, of a, the queen, or the wife of Ahab, most wicked woman ever, finds out what Elijah's done. Finds out about this big showdown and how he, he kills all of these prophets. And so Jezebel sends this in, a messenger to Elijah and says, I will do the same as what you've done to my prophets. That's something, to be, that's something to be afraid of. So he has this incredible courage to go in front of all these people, <clears throat> all these non-believers, people who are doing the opposite of God and, and makes the right, does the right thing and then kills and eliminates what's evil. And he flees for his life and his life is at risk of being killed and, and being taken away. That's something, seems like legitimate fear, legitimate reason to be courageous. Direct that in a different way. And we have real similar ways. Bring that 21st century. I mean, go to Yahoo News, go to anything online and see what's going on in the world and what people are doing being completely contrary to what God wants us to do. And Jezebel here being the leader of the, the land there, one of the influential people, in the same, in the same way, so many of our leaders that, that um, are, are governing us and making executive decisions are, are saying, this is what's going to happen. And then you open God's word and say, that should not happen. We have some real serious things that we have to stand up for. People doing the at 180 degrees different direction from what God wants. Not only that, but the people who are leading us are making executive decisions to say this is what is right, when it clearly, clearly is not. And just like the miracle that God performed by sucking up all the water and taking up all the dirt and burning all the stones and just amazing work of the saturated altar, burning it up with no rain, and so long, Elijah's like, there, it's obvious. People see it and they see, yes, God is God. God is the Lord. Jehovah is Lord. In the same respect that we have the word and it says, look 
at what this is. It's a complete, it's salvation. It's what's true. We have this answer. We have what's right. And it's just so hard to, to see the, how people can turn away. And we have to be courageous and, and show people what an amazing thing uh, that we have in, in, in contrast to what they're preaching or what they're teaching. So now kind of come back a little bit. I was talking about how I was raised. All these elements and all those things, it sounds like, okay, this is, he was just sheltered his whole life. And that may be one way, one perspective, but that was a way to help me understand how people act. You know, in, in high school and college, you, you are kind of sheltered in general. You're just kind of immature. And then you, you realize what the world is like and you kind of figure out, I've got to make these decisions. So it's an incredible blessing to be raised the way I was. So certainly those people, I'm talking about those people, the people of the world and these, these high-ranking officials who make these uh, outlandish proclamations about what's right is clearly wrong, sin. Those people, it seems easy to say, okay, those people, yeah, we need to be courage, courageous about evil, about wicked people. We need to be courageous and tell the truth, that, speak the truth. Well, let's bring it, bring it home, bring it a little bit closer. If you want to flip over to Numbers 14, that's where we'll go next. Numbers 14, Moses is the leader of the, uh, of the children of Israel, and they're headed to the promised land of Canaan. And God tells Moses, I need you to pick chiefs from each tribe, 12 people to go spy out the land of Canaan to give a report back to the people. The men do that, and they come back. Ten of them give a bad report, and they actually blur the lines and, and kind of exaggerate the truth. Two of them give a good report. Joshua and Caleb come back and say, we can do this. You know, these people are our bread. We're able to take this. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. And these other 10 spies are saying, we're grasshoppers and they're in these people's eyes. They're giants. They're going to kill us. There's no way. Let's not do this. They rise up and try to just kind of go another direction. Often we consider the faithfulness, of, the faithlessness of the 10 spies. We focus at least in my experience, it seems like we focus on the faithlessness of those people and the faith in the other two, Joshua and Caleb, to take on the land of Canaan. Consider what Joshua and Caleb are doing. Joshua and Caleb, let's, let's just read it. Let's look here. Verse uh, 6 through 9, chapter 14. <clears throat> and Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Je who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, the land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. And if the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Uh, milk, milk and honey. Not only, um, I'm sorry, only do not rebel against the Lord, um, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. So we're talking about the faithlessness of these ten, ten spies and the faith of the two, Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb are, sure, they're not afraid of the, the inhabitants of Canaan, but they're not afraid of these other ten spies. They're not afraid of their peers. That, that is something to be uh, acknowledged. They're also not afraid of these 10 spies, but they're not afraid of what's going to happen. Look in verse 10. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones, but the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Consider the courage that Joshua and Caleb needed. Not to say, I have faith in God that we can take Canaan, but to say, I have faith in God that I'm going to be this 2% against everyone else and say, 
you're wrong. That's not what you should be doing. That's not what you should be thinking. It's not easy for us to do the right thing among peers that are doing the wrong thing. Hopefully, Lord willing, you don't have peers that are ready to chuck stones at you when you are wanting to do the right thing. But for peers that are doing the wrong thing, they are trying to take down our spiritual life. They are trying to kill us in some way, spiritually. So just think about that. I mean, I had to think about that for a while, that Joshua and Caleb, of what they're, what they're doing, what they're saying, these people that were, that were chosen equal with them, they're saying, you're wrong. It's not easy to, to reject your peers or teach against your peers, I should say. <clears throat> it's not easy to be the oddball out, to be, to be the lower number um, when there's, it's not easy to, to speak clean language when everyone around you is speaking bad, to say, I, you know, I'd prefer you to just to respect what I'm thinking. It's not easy to stay away from temptations when your, your peers, everyone else is giving in. Um, it's not, as a teenager, it's not easy to participate in worship when the cool thing or the cool guys uh, just kind of sit back in the pew and cross our arms. It's not easy to be at work with your coworkers that you see every day to day in and day out stand for the truth and to say, you know, no, um, I'm not going to go to happy hour today. Or I would appreciate it if we just didn't talk like that around me. Or could you not say the Lord's name in vain? And here's why. It's not easy to be <laughs> that low number. It's not easy to, to have that courage. There was a guy here, or not here, there was a guy at, um, who was in a, a work meeting. Work called, called this meeting, going to talk about their manual. And so everybody's crowded in the room, however many people. It was a true story. And the guy's sitting in the back, and the CEO or CFO, one of the big, big wigs, is talking about the new manual and is saying, okay, now we're going to talk about human resources and, and um, quality of uh, what, we present to our company and what we present to everyone as our company. And they talk about diverse um, lifestyles. So they get to a point and they say, we are happy and excited to, to welcome in the LGBT uh, community and to say that we are, we are a company that uh, supports and does not um, look down on homosexuals or anyone transgender or anything like this. And the guy said, I stood up and, and said, no, that's, that's not right. I cannot do this. I, I need to vocalize this. Um, I need to, to say that this is not correct. And if this is the way the operation is going to be going on, I'm going to leave. And uh, all the work that I've put in is going to be lost. And I'm sorry, this is not going to happen. And the guy telling that story, he said, well, that's what I wanted to say. And instead, he sat in the back with his arms crossed and nodded his head, took the manual, and went back to his office. And it's a good thing that my, my mouth is the closest to my ears because I need to hear this probably more than anybody. Um, it's really easy to not be courageous. You know, being courageous is not just being necessarily brave or fearless. Being courageous is knowing what you're afraid of and doing it anyway. And so often we, we're, we're really knowledgeable of what we're afraid of, so we steer clear as, as best as possible. That's something I don't want to do. That makes me uncomfortable or it's a little awkward or you know, I'm just not going to do it. Regardless of how right it may be. Let's think of even closer peers. So we've got friends and talk about friends and coworkers. Think about people whose options and lifestyles are contrary to the truth. And I don't have to look very far. You, you may not have to look very far. You consider who, who you need to be courageous with. You need to be create, courageous with um, a brother who's fallen from the truth, who's, who's participating in things that aren't right, a physical brother, a literal blood brother, maybe your sister. Are you courageous enough to say, this is not right? And, you know, those are really awkward conversations. Like, it's, it takes a lot for me to, to swallow and to, to talk biblically or about religion or beliefs 
with some of the people that I'm closest with. I don't know why that is, but it is. But can you talk to, maybe your mother is not faithful. Do you have the courage to, to talk to her? Maybe your dad's not faithful. Maybe you have a friend who thinks they know more of God's word. Doing what you know you're afraid of is courage. <clears throat> and it's hard. And it's not fun whatsoever. <laughs> and being around an environment and a world who wants to do the easy and fun thing, it's easy to let that happen, to, to, to fall into that category of doing the easy and more fun thing and to avoid the difficult and not fun thing, as simple as that sounds. And we give a lot of excuses. I give a lot of excuses. I had a conversation with a really good friend. We were talk yesterday talking about another really good friend who has left the faith and thinks this other doctrine, this not doctrine, this other belief is, is the way to go. And, and I told him I haven't even talked to him. It's been a year and a half, and I have no idea what to say. And that's one of my excuses. I don't know what to say. It's really hard. It's awkward. And my friend said, it's not fun. And we've, I said, you know, every time I've tried before, this is about the time I'm giving up. And you have to have the courage that God tells you to have. Some people that we really love and admire do the same thing. Flip over to Exodus 3, if you would. So we were just talking about um, Elijah having his life at risk. So Jezebel finds out that Elijah's done these things, and he's, she says, I'm going to kill you the same way you killed my prophets, killed the prophets of Baal. So Elijah flees. He runs to Mount Hor, or he, he runs unto a, under a, I think it's called a bush, uh, a broom tree, bush tree, I can't remember. He runs in there, he's scared. He says, God, I'm the only one. God provides for him. 40 days, 40 nights later, he, he winds up at Mount Horeb in a cave, and he says, I'm the only one. If you, if you, do you feel like that out of maybe your group of friends or you're part of the, that part of the family? I'm the only one that wants to do what's right, and no one else will listen to me. God told Elijah, you know, there's 7,000 other people who have not fallen their knees to Baal or any other god. You're not the only one. It will be okay. And in a still small voice, God told him what to do, and Elijah got his act together and figured out what to do. So Elijah ran to a cave at Mount Horeb. On that same mountain, uh, Moses, a good time before Elijah, Moses was on that mountain and saw a burning bush. In chapter 3, verse 9 uh, and 10 is where God gives his first um, uh, call to Moses. Let's look at verse 9. And now behold, the, now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. This is God talking. Has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which uh, the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you will bring my people and children of Israel out of Egypt. So here's God's call to him. Let's look in verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So uh, God tells him what he needs to do. Moses immediately and quickly says, uh, but I'm just Moses. That's just, I'm just Moses. So God gives this really great and lengthy explanation of the exact plan of what he wants to do from verses 12 to 22. Then chapter 4, verse 1, Moses comes back again. So God said all these things, said here's an exact, exact plan of what we're going to do. Then Moses says, behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. For they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. So he says, okay, who am I? And then in verse 1 he says, they're not going to believe me. And so God gives a second call to him and says, and goes uh, from verse 2 to 9. And then in verse 10, let's look at verse 10. So Moses has, has two excuses. 
but Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, uh, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and tongue. So Moses just goes back to back to back and says, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. And God says, you can, you will, you can, you will, you can, and you will. In the same way, in the same way that I think of every excuse under the sun, God says, you can and you will, you can and you will. I don't know what to say. You can and you will. And God knows doing the right thing is scary. <clears throat> he knows it's doing the right thing for us is scary. To have courage, it's, it's a difficult thing. God knows this. He knows that standing out of, from the crowd and being different and telling your peers and telling higher people than you that they're wrong, he knows it's difficult. Even Jesus experienced anxiety, as, as um, we heard this morning. Um, we spoke about Jesus and his, his sweats, his drop of, drops of, as blood. You know, Jesus had extreme stress. And as painful, I think you said, beautiful and, and terrible at the same time. And it was. And it's a beautiful thing to know that Jesus has that same concern and same mind as a human that he, he was on our level and had that same stress and understands. So Moses had all these complaints and went on to be an incredible leader. Disobey God so he didn't go into the land of Canaan, but then a new leader came on, and his name was Joshua. And Joshua, like we were talking about earlier, confronted his peers and was that one in a million kind of chance thing and said, you know what, everybody's wrong and God's right. We can do it. So God chose Joshua as a leader. If you want to turn to Joshua chapter 1. Uh, God chose Joshua as a leader when Moses passed away. <clears throat> this is a little bit of a, a read here, verses 1 through um, 9. I'm not a very good reader, so we'll try to chuck through this. So, 1 through 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over to the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I have promised to Moses, from the wilderness of Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. All the land of the Hittites and the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. So right there, God said, here's what you're going to do, and it's a huge thing you've got to do. So what does he follow up with that in verse 6? Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land. I swore to their fathers to give them. Okay, that's another big thing. You're going to do this huge thing. Again, only be strong and very courageous. Being careful to do according to all the law of Moses, my servant commanded you, do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to, the, to do accordingly, I'm sorry, to do according to all that is written in it. Um, for then you will make your ways prosperous, and then you will have good success. Uh, have I not commanded you? Another huge thing he's telling you. Like, take this law, you're going to abide by every word. You're going to do all of it. That's a hard thing to do, and it's scary. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I'm so glad Jeremy led that song. It is so appropriate for what we're talking about. God tells Joshua three times. You know, the leader he had before gave three excuses of why he was scared. So God tells his new leader, here's three, re here's three things. You're going to be strong and courageous. You're going to be strong and courageous. You're going to be strong and very courageous. God's telling him these things that are scary. And he's, God's saying, I know they're scary, but you're going to be courageous. courageous. You're going to handle it. There's a, there's a, a brother of mine, not a physical, I mean, a brother in Christ of mine who we've, 
we talked about different things and he said, I've got to, I've got to lead a prayer next Sunday and it's you know, Tuesday. He's like, I'm sweating. I'm scared about it. And, uh, he, he thinks about it every day, every day. I've got to lead a prayer Sunday. It's Friday. I've got to lead a prayer in two days at church. Saturday, I've got to lead a prayer. Sunday morning, he leads the prayer, but he leads the prayer. He's scared to do the simple thing, but he does it. And that's courage. In the same way that Joshua was afraid to do this humongous thing, God knew there was fear in his heart. He says, don't be, just be courageous. We're called to be courageous. When we face wicked people that seek our lives, we're called to be courageous. When we're facing giants that are all the same size as us, we're called to be courageous. Much like Daniel was thrown into a pit of lions, he was courageous. I'm realizing I skipped that point entirely, but that's okay. We're running out of time. Uh, we're called to be courageous. Just as Satan is prowling around the world like a roaring lion, First Peter says, we're to have courage. In Revelation 21, you can turn there if you want to. It's going to be a quick one. You know, there's a, a kid's song. Um, Revelation, Revelation 21, 8. And we always think about the liars go to hell. The first sin listed in this, in this passage. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as of murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars, their, por their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. If there's any, if there's any um, uh, reason for listing things first to last, even if there's not, this is listed in it. Um, but as for the cowardly. So when, uh, to kind of close all this, when... When we plan to be courageous, you better plan to be um, persecuted. You better plan on some negative things coming your way. Second Timothy, uh, Brother Steve used this passage last week. Second Timothy 3, verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly, uh, live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So, if I have a puddle of diesel and I have a match, if I strike that match and light the puddle, it will burn. If you desire to live godly, you will be persecuted. So for me, when I think of that, I think, am I being, am I being persecuted? No. So what does that mean? Am I seeking out ways and conquering things with courage? Am I seeking things that aren't necessarily fun or easy, but they're for the right thing? They're for God. They're for the church. Am I being persecuted? Persecution will come if you're seeking to live godly. And, of course, we have to have faith to do that. And the theme um, that we're directed to this year is uh, in Luke 15, I'm sorry, Luke 17, 5, where these apostles who see Jesus work miracles every day and hear the Son of God talk to them directly and who have a front seat to everything we think about, dream about, work for, they, it's their life. These people say, Lord, increase our faith. How much greater does our faith have to be? So we should seek the faith that we need to be courageous. I should ask the Lord, increase our faith um, so that our courage may grow. It's not easy. It's not fun. It's sad. It's hard. And I want to quit a lot. But I'm called to be strong and courageous. So I'm just reminding you to be strong and courageous. And the good news is, you know, either participating here, if you're going to lead a prayer next Sunday, we've got 220 people here that are on your side that are excited. 
and we're stuck and feeling like I'm going to quit in whatever aspect of Christian life. Everyone here, I'm certain, is excited and ready to help you be courageous. But more importantly than anybody in, any, in this building, God is telling you and he's excited to be on your side for you to be strong and courageous. If you're avoiding becoming a Christian because it's scary, then you're right. It's a scary thing and it's difficult and it's a lot of work if you're doing it right. But it has the biggest reward than anything you could ever imagine. Um, and God calls for you to be courageous. Have the courage to come forward. You know, we'll all stand up together, so it makes it that much easier for you to walk down here. Um, but even if later on, if, if God allows us to live later on, and you, you feel the need to, to obey the gospel, then do it. Be courageous. When you come to your friend who is not faithful, who knows the truth, if you go to your, your husband or wife or your brother or your sister, be courageous and seek after God. If any of this helps and if you'd like to come forward, then you can do that as we stand and as we sing.
There may be some here who this was their only opportunity to worship on this Lord's Day, and we wish to accommodate you in all aspects of the worship by those in here that need to play with the Lord's Day. Dear Lord, we thank you for this bread, a symbol of Christ's death body that hung on the cross. Lord, may those that partake of it do so, thinking back on the significance of that great sacrifice, the life of your Son, for the eternal lives of those who are called your children. These prayers we ask in his name, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we continue our prayer to you. Thank you for this cup, this food, vine, and this fruit, the Son, the blood, and shed for us. God, we pray to you. Be with those now that we take this cup and we'll get back to the cross and to the blood of us. Shed for our sins. Thank you so much for the sacrifice of your Son. For our goodness that we have, for the hope and for the life of the day, God. Be with those at this time. Thank you so much for your, your Son. Let me pray. And an opportunity for those who might like to give at this time to catch our attention as we pass the ground.
Well, if you're visiting with us tonight, we're glad to have you. Hope you come back and be with us again soon. We had two good lessons by Jared and Micah. Appreciate y'all's effort in presenting those lessons. Both of them were very fine lessons. It's been a good day of worship. Any other announcements by the elders? We'll have our closing prayer. Bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we gather here today to, to worship you and, and praise your name, Lord. And we also come together as Christians and as a family of, of, of the of family of Christ to encourage each other and give each other strength and to help each other along this life uh, as, we, as each of us face individual trials and temptations and then as a whole face trials and temptations. Lord, help us to strengthen each other and, and keep us going and keep everyone traveling on the, the right path, Lord. We ask that you uh, you be with the Craig family as they, as they go through this difficult time in their life with the death of a, a loved one and the news, the bad news of an illness in their family. Help them to, to push through and help us to do whatever we can to, to be there for them, Lord, if, if and when they need it. We ask, Lord, that you... Give us the strength and the courage as we go through our lives individually to stand up for Christ and what's right and to do what we need to, to make sure that our light shines to all who knows us and, and sees our actions, Lord. We thank you for that beautiful and unfortunate sacrifice that Jesus had to make for us and to save us, to, to save us from, from our sins, Lord. Because you loved us so much that you you wish that we were that we would choose to be in heaven with you and to embrace your glory and to stay with you, Lord. And we thank you so much for that. Please help us to, to carry on, Lord, and, and to be strong as we leave here and go our separate ways, Lord. And please help the sick to get well and Help the, the bad people with uh, problems and issues in their life. Help them to turn to you, Lord, for wisdom and guidance. And keep, please keep us safe and bring us back in the next appointed time. In Jesus' name, amen.